It's April 1945, and the war in Europe is winding down. Germany is surrounded. The Soviets are about to make their way to Berlin, and a victory for the Allies against the Third Reich is all but guaranteed. But on the other side of the globe, the deadliest days of the Pacific Theatre are just beginning. As the tide of war shifted dramatically in favor of the United States in the final months of the war, Japan prepared for a final stand. A desperate shot at a much-needed victory on the island of Okinawa in a battle which would forever be remembered for its scale and ferocity. Oh, when we say that the tide of war was turning, this is not an understatement. Taking defeats one after another, Imperial Japan was not only losing various islands and military bases, but also its experienced men and resources. They'd lost hundreds of ships, thousands of aircraft, and thousands more men between 1942 and 1945 but it was about to get a whole lot worse. Early in 1945, the United States had successfully captured Iwo Jima, an island that was brimming with fortified positions. And with Iwo Jima out of the way, there was only really one important island stronghold that remained, Okinawa. Okinawa was seen as the final stepping stone into mainland Japan, the empire's last grip on its dwindling power over the Pacific. Not only was it necessary to neutralize the Japanese forces on the island, but Okinawa itself would be an ideal place to construct air bases as the war crept further and further away from the United States. But long before the battle had begun, there were fears of the blood that it would draw. Iwo Jima had been defended by a much smaller force, and despite America's overwhelming air and naval superiority, it had turned into an absolute bloodbath as soon as soldiers began landing on the beaches. Many of the Americans that participated in those landings were now preparing to land on the shores of Okinawa, so they were more than aware of the horrors awaiting their amphibious assault. But Iwo Jima had at least been evacuated ahead of the battle. Okinawa was still fully populated, with an estimated 300,000 civilians stuck on the islands, the majority of whom were native Okinawans, and all of whom were about to be caught in the crossfire. Even those still in school wouldn't be spared from the fight. Several thousand children as young as 13 were mobilized, with the boys forming a frontline division called the Taketsu Kinatai, and the young girls being trained to aid the army's nurses. Along with them, around 40,000 other Okinawans were conscripted to fight the Americans. Aside from hastily drafted civilians, guarding Okinawa was the Japanese 32nd Army, made up of roughly 77,000 men. In preparation for the battle, the United States formed the 10th Army, a cross-branch force made up of both Army and Marine divisions, whose job it would be to launch the dreaded amphibious landing, supported, of course, from the sky and from the sea. Commanding this force was General Buckner, who had experience against Japan after leading the Aleutian Islands campaign. Throughout late March, American troops landed on the smaller Karama Islands to the southwest of Okinawa, which were guarded by a force numbering around 600. It took about five days to capture these, and losses were fairly high, with more than 100 casualties. But these islands had been a staging ground for Japanese suicide boats, and their elimination meant that landing craft could now safely approach Okinawa. A couple of weeks later, the United States edged even closer, taking a few abandoned islands just a few miles west of Okinawa. Okinawa, so close, in fact, that the artillery set up there was well within range of the main island. On April the 1st, the real battle began as U.S. forces began landing on the western coast of Okinawa. To their pleasant surprise, the defenses here were minimal and the beaches were secured with ease. Keeping up the momentum, the 10th Army began sweeping across the central part of the island and captured two critical air bases before the sun had even set on the first day of the battle. With the first step already completed with such ease, the 10th Army wasted no time initiating the second phase of the attack and began moving to secure the northern half of Okinawa. While the fighting on land had just begun to unfold, a battle of immense scale would soon erupt on the sea and in the sky. The United States had brought a massive force to Okinawa, which over the course of the entire battle would consist of more than 3,000 aircraft, 27 cruisers, 18 battleships, and more than 170 destroyers and destroyer escorts. And guarding the American southern flank was a British Commonwealth fleet, accompanied by more than 250 aircraft. The unfathomable scale of the naval and aerial battles is what would earn the Battle of Okinawa the nickname Typhoon of Steel, both for its size and its utter chaos. The steel typhoon began to swell just days after the first amphibious landings, when more than 400 Japanese aircraft took off from the mainland and began attacking the American fleet, and throughout April more than 20 US ships would be sunk and more than 150 damaged, many due to kamikaze attacks. Japan had been known to launch kamikaze sorties before, but around Okinawa is where they really made their mark on history. 
Between April and June, nearly 1,500 kamikaze aircraft were sent screaming toward the enemy in waves so large that they struck fear into the hearts of every American who witnessed it. Vice Admiral Brown recalled, We watched each plunging kamikaze with the detached horror of one witnessing a terrible spectacle rather than as the intended victim. Most of the ships lost to these attacks were the smaller ones, like landing craft or radar ships, but even many aircraft carriers took some damage. While the waves of suicide planes must have been quite the terrifying sight, one of the most historic moments of the battle occurred on April the 7th during Japan's Operation Tengo. Tengo was a desperate attempt to defend Okinawa, a daring mission in which 10 ships would fight their way through the American naval forces and beach themselves on Okinawa's coast, turning their many guns into coastal defenses. Leading the strike force was none other than the Yamato, who along with her sister ship was the heaviest and most heavily armed battleship in all of history. For some context, her main armament was the Type 94 gun, a 21 meter cannon that weighed a staggering 147 tons, and she had nine of them. The secondary armament consisted of more than a dozen turrets of various calibers and more than 160 anti-aircraft guns. If Yamato could reach the beaches of Okinawa, things could get really dicey for the Americans ashore. Carrying only enough fuel for a one-way trip, Yamato and her nine escorts began cruising towards Okinawa and made contact with the Americans on April the 7th. The 10 a.m. American fighters arrived high in the sky, ready to duel any Japanese interceptors defending the approaching ships, but they found nothing but empty clouds. Yamato and her team were sitting ducks. Just after noon, 280 American torpedo and bomber aircraft filled the sky over Japan's prized battleship, and soon the air was filled with anti-aircraft fire. In the first hour or so, five bombs struck the ship, destroying one of its radar rooms and damaging many turrets, along with four torpedoes that each struck Yamato's port side. This left the ship listing to one side, and the crew scrambled to correct this by counter-flooding the opposite. But things were about to get a lot worse. With one of the boilers damaged, the ship was struggling to maintain speed, and many of the guns had been taken out by strafing aircraft. Half an hour later, a second attack commenced, with planes swooping in and dropping torpedoes from every direction, striking the escorts as they tried to encircle and protect Yamato. During the second wave, three more torpedoes struck portside, and Yamato began listing to a dangerous degree. The third and final attack sealed her fate with several more torpedo strikes. By 2 p.m., the order was given to abandon the ship, which was now listing so severely that further torpedo strikes hit the bottom of her hull. As she began to roll onto her side in the water, one of the major magazines exploded, creating a mushroom cloud nearly four miles high. The jewel of Japan's navy had been defeated, along with four of her escorts in a battle that only took a few hours. In total, Japan lost 3,700 men in the confrontation at a cost of only 12 US airmen, and long before she reached Okinawa. It truly was the epitome of Japan's desperation in the final months of the war, ready to sacrifice everything they had instead of surrendering, something that would be painfully clear to the 10th Army back on Okinawa. Back on land, the situation was getting intense. In a week, the 10th Army had marched all the way back to the northernmost point on the island, and the remaining enemy forces in the north of the island had been isolated on the Matobu Peninsula. The battle here would be vicious, as the rough, mountainous terrain favored the defenders who fought from the rocky ridges lining the front line. The brutal fighting lasted for days, until the north was finally cleared on April the 18th. With the north out of the way, the attention turned to southern Okinawa. The terrain here was similar to the north, if not worse, and guarded by even more men. A considerable number of the defenses were centered around the city Shuri, with the so-called Shuri Line extending out from it across the land. But even getting close to the Shuri Line would prove to be difficult. The Americans would advance on Japanese positions after thoroughly pounding them with bombers and naval guns, but the Japanese had built a network of tunnels throughout their defenses, where they would seek shelter during the bombing runs, making them largely ineffective. With the brunt of the fighting back in the hands of the ground forces, fierce fighting erupted as the Japanese rained bullets and grenades on the advancing Americans, ensuring that for every lost position, they took down as many enemies as possible. Once the Americans had reached a defensive network known as the Kakazu Line, the U.S. attack began to stall, unable to break through the intense defenses and jagged ridges lined with determined Japanese soldiers. Most notably, the Japanese held positions on what is known as a reverse slope, which is where a second hill is located in front of the defenders, creating a small valley that must be crossed by the attacking side. This largely negated U.S. mortar and artillery power by obstructing their line of sight and made it difficult to advance without walking right into a trap, but General Buckner remained convinced that a breakthrough could could be achieved. It would be an understatement to say that the battle here was brutal, as each side threw everything they had at individual hills, desperately trying to make some sort of progress in the mayhem. 
It was also here that famed medic Desmond Doss would receive the Medal of Honor for saving the lives of an estimated 75 soldiers, or without the use of a gun, as violence was strictly against his religious beliefs. In the citation for his award, it was described how he waded through seas of bullets with grenades raining down around him, dragging his wounded comrades to safety and treating their wounds no matter the danger surrounding him. And this was despite being wounded four different times. This fierce combat played out all across the front line, with some of the most horrifying scenes emerging when caves needed to be cleared of combatants, a task often handled by flamethrowers or flame tanks. At the beginning of May, Japan launched its biggest counteroffensive of the battle, trying to pull off a risky amphibious landing behind American lines. However, while providing cover for said landing, the Japanese moved much of their artillery into the open, and it was subsequently destroyed, leading to the quick destruction of their attempted flank maneuver. On the 11th of May, General Buckner ordered a renewed American assault, during which two key hills were captured, nicknamed Conical Hill and Sugarloaf Hill. Both of these had been heavily defended, and many lives were lost during their capture, but their seizure provided a clear view of the city Shuri, which Buckner hoped to soon encircle. But that encirclement would have to wait. As the monsoons began to cover the island in heavy rain, Okinawa began to look less like a battle in the Second World War, and more like Verdun, or the Somme, nearly three decades earlier. Each side was entrenched in the muddy, wet mess, with so many corpses unable to be retrieved that their rotting piles filled the entire island with the stench of death and decay. Regardless, the Americans inched forward where they could. By early June, following a heavy offshore bombardment from the USS Mississippi, the Japanese defending Shuri Castle decided to withdraw, fleeing south. Not wanting to let the opportunity slip away, Marines quickly captured the position, unaware that an American bombing run was en route to their location, as the castle was not technically among their objectives. After panicked communications, this bombing was called off at the last second, likely preventing a friendly fire catastrophe. With Shuri now falling, the rest of the Japanese forces continued running south and began preparing to defend their final defensive positions on the Kian Peninsula. It was here, in the final chapter of this battle, that General Buckner would be killed, struck by artillery fire while checking on his men near the front. But even without him, there was no stopping the Allied momentum. As the Americans advanced both on the ground and through several more amphibious landings, this last scene would be the place of the greatest slaughter of Okinawa, with tens of thousands of civilians losing their lives. Native Okinawans had been told that American soldiers would do unspeakable things to their wives and children, so many desperately attacked with nothing more than spears. And as the situation looked more dire for Japan, thousands of mothers threw themselves and their children off the southern cliffs truly believing that death was preferable to falling into the hands of who they had been told were white devils. And they weren't the only ones to take matters into their own hands. As the final Japanese pockets began to be surrounded, thousands of soldiers would end their lives in the tunnels, including the highest-ranking Japanese official on the island, General Ushijima, who committed seppuku on June the 21st in the final hours of the battle. This marked the end of large-scale hostilities, though cleanup operations continued for a couple of weeks to weed out any remaining guerrilla fighters throughout the island. By June the 30th, the island was deemed clear. Okinawa had fallen. Okinawa was the bloodiest battle of the entire Pacific Theater, with the Americans suffering about 50,000 casualties and the Japanese suffering around 77,000, including 30,000 conscripted Okinawans. Of the civilian population on the island, a shocking half of them were killed, totaling 150,000. The most horrifying aspect of the battle is that not all of these deaths were from combat. It was well documented that the Japanese used the natives as human shields, forced them at gunpoint to fetch supplies, and coerced them into suicide near the end of the battle. Combat translators were able to save many from ending their own lives, but this number is eclipsed by the thousands who went through the act. One Okinawan official later told The Guardian, You have the Battle of Britain, in which your airmen protected the British people. We had the Battle of Okinawa, in which the exact opposite happened. The Japanese army not only starved the Okinawans, but used them as human shields. That dark history is still present today, and Japan and the US should study it before they decide what to do next. The islands had been absolutely devastated. In the span of just 80 days, it had gone from a tropical island with rich culture and architecture into a wasteland of ruins, fire, and maggots. 90% of the buildings had been destroyed, so even those who had miraculously survived had certainly lost their home, left only with trauma from the war. But the Battle of Okinawa had a much greater impact on the overall war than it appears on the surface. In fact, it potentially changed the world. Because of the ferocity with which the Japanese defended the island and the appalling attitude they had towards civilians, the United States was desperate to look for an alternative to invading mainland Japan. All they could imagine was Okinawa, but on a scale of 75 million people. 
If the same type of combat were to erupt in Tokyo, Osaka, and many other densely populated cities, the battle had the potential to be the greatest loss of life in all of human history. It is believed that this fear is one of the major reasons why the decision was made to drop the atomic bomb on Japan and force their hand in surrender, marking the only wartime use of nuclear weapons in history and bringing an end to the final chapter of World War II.